dropped the bombs is the topic I'd like to discuss with you today, and I hope we have plenty of time for Q&A because it's a never-ending uh, topic of fascination to lots of people. <clears throat> Hiroshima and Nagasaki raise some profound questions about how the 20th century is going to be remembered. Why were atomic bombs dropped on those two cities? Did the bombs hasten the end of World War II, or did they actually prolong the end of the war? How credible is the argument that the U.S. used these nuclear weapons to spare American lives and Japanese lives from an invasion of the Japanese home islands? And what role did President Harry Truman play in the decision to drop the bombs? Preparing this talk, I'm glad I spent some time in Hungary working on the biography of Leo Szilard. Why Hungary? Well, the Hungarian, the Hungarian physicist now likes to say about his country's political history, the past is less certain than the future. Here too, our history is constantly rewritten, reinvented, reinterpreted, rediscovered. And unlike the future, which is still unknown, our understanding of the past continues to expand and to deepen with research and reflection. We all know or know of a GI who was in the Pacific or was headed for the Pacific in the summer of 1945, and who credits the A-bomb with saving his life. Historian Paul Fussell's book, Thank God for the Atom Bomb, is authentic based on what he and other GIs knew then and learned ever since. But in this talk, I'll introduce you to another perspective. This is not a view from the trenches or the troop ships, but from the very top of the chain of command. There, President Truman and Soviet Premier Stalin faced a different set of options, both as allies and as adversaries. Many of you have long wondered about Harry Truman's role in the atomic bombing of Japan. And he himself, through the course of his life, had different interpretations of what he actually decided and what he actually did. Truman had been Franklin Roosevelt's vice president for only a dozen weeks and he knew nothing about the bomb until FDR died on April 12th in 1945. That night, after becoming president, Truman's mentor, James F. Burns, told him vaguely about some secret new weapon. But two weeks passed before the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, and the head of the Manhattan Project, Leslie Groves, sat down with Truman and gave him a full briefing about the ABO. For the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima, the Library of Congress magazine, Civilization, convened a roundtable discussion of historians with wide-ranging views about the A-bomb decision. This is the issue that we produced, and it includes a timeline and even a, an amusing article on the invasion that never occurred. and uh, we just celebrated uh, uh, D-Day, and the beaches were named Omaha and such. Do you know what the beaches were named in Japan? They were named after American cars, Stutz and Studebaker and Hudson and uh, Dodge and Chevrolet Beach. Luckily, we never needed them. After hours of discussion at that Library of Congress session, we agreed on five major reasons the A-bombs leveled Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that I discussed in the article, Why We Dropped the Bomb. Last month, I participated in a conference at Truman's Little White House in Key West, Florida, where historians discussed the decision to drop the bomb and Truman's nuclear legacy. The Library of Congress Roundtable concluded there were five major reasons the USA dropped A-bombs on Japan. And the fighting quickly, post-war diplomacy, bureaucratic momentum, political justification, and psychological factors. In my view, all five of these reasons led to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Historians continue to debate, to debate about which of these reasons might have been more dominant, but all five, I think, were significant. To end the fighting quickly, 
The United States and the Allies were war-weary by the summer of 1945. Victory won in Europe still eluded us in the Pacific. Anything was worth a try to stop the fighting. Post-war diplomacy. Truman's new Secretary of State, James Burns, and some military leaders saw the awesome weapon as a way to make the Soviets, as Burns said, more manageable. First, by ending the Pacific War before Stalin had promised to join in August, and second, by countering Stalin's political gains in Eastern Europe. Third, bureaucratic momentum. Fearing that Germany was working on an A-bomb, President Franklin Roosevelt began America's research in 1939. He agreed to make it a high priority project just before Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. This became the Manhattan Project, a secret $2 billion effort worth more than $20 billion today, involving hundreds of thousands of workers at dozens of secret sites around the country. In the end, the commitment to build the bomb produced a powerful impulse to also use it. Fourth, political justification. Some American military and civilian leaders pushed the White House to use the bomb before Japan could surrender to justify the money spent behind Congress's back. As Truman himself said on August 6th, we have spent $2 billion on the greatest scientific gamble in history. We won. With Congress in mind, an aide to Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson was more direct. If this thing works, he said, they won't investigate anything. And if it doesn't work, they won't investigate anything else. <laughs> Psychological factors would be the fifth reason. After four bloody years of war, Americans in high office were eager to crush the enemy and bring home the boys. Public feeling was running so high against the Japanese and their barbaric wartime behavior that many American leaders were in no mood to take additional casualties. Now, have you noticed something missing? Missing from this list is the reason for those bombings that we still hear most often, to save American and Japanese lives and casualties from an Allied invasion. Why is it not then a major factor? Because at the time, such a costly invasion seemed possible but unlikely. America's leaders knew that Stalin had promised FDR at Yalta in February 1945 to join the Allies against Japan three months after Germany surrendered. To avoid a two-front war, Stalin had a neutrality pact with Japan, which by 1945 he was eager to break in order to gain strategic ports and territory in the Pacific, in effect to get in on the kill. Germany surrendered on May 8th, meaning Stalin would break neutrality and attack Japan by mid-August, a promise he confirmed at Potsdam in July. With Stalin's assurance he would soon join the Allies, Truman wrote in his diary that night, Fini Japs, when that comes. The first Allied invasion of Japan wasn't planned for the South Island until November of 1945, and for the main island until March of 1946. Some diplomatic historians even claim that the bomb prolonged the war. Well, how could that be? Because, they say, the USA thought it might have an A-bomb by the fall of 1945, and then it dismissed Japanese queries for favorable surrender terms, which the Japanese sought through the then-neutral Soviets and the Swiss in June of 1945. I think that's a stretch, because while the Japanese diplomats were seeking better terms, the military was still battling to save the emperor. So in the summer of 1945, an invasion was still a possibility, not yet a necessity. And it certainly wasn't the either-or alternative to A-bombs we commonly hear today. That either-or choice became the best and the most welcome justification, but only afterward. For many Americans, one trouble with the A-bomb's legacy is that they don't know or remember the whole story. Causes and effects are blurred. Mostly we remember three dates. August 6th, we bombed Hiroshima. 
August 9th, we bombed Nagasaki. August 14th, Japan agreed to surrender. Seems pretty simple. Too simple, I'm afraid, because there are a couple of other dates often overlooked. One is August 8th, when, as promised, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and invaded occupied Manchuria. Within a week, Stalin was ready to invade Japan's northern island of Hokkaido and eager to occupy as much of the country as he could. Scholarship by the Japanese-American historian uh, Toshishiko Sayushi Hasegawa concludes that it was a twin shock of Hiroshima and the Soviet attack that prompted the emperor to call for surrender even before Nagasaki was bombed. The other overlooked date is August 10th, when President Truman ordered that a third A-bomb, which would be ready in a week or two, not be deployed without his personal approval. On August 10th, Truman did his first detailed briefing about Hiroshima, and later that day he told the cabinet that he didn't like the idea of killing 100,000 people, especially, as he said, all those kids. In my view, this was the first time Truman was able to make a decision about the bomb, and it asserted not only his authority, but also his humanity. Truman's nuclear legacy is that he decided to drop the bomb. In fact, his trusted mentor, James F. Burns, was Truman's representative on the secret interim committee that decided during May and June of 45 how A-bombs would be used. If they worked at all, we didn't know until the middle of July that they worked. General Leslie Gross, the military head of the Manhattan Project, sped up uranium and plutonium production in the spring of 45, fearing the war would end before its bombs were ready. And after the first bomb was tested in mid-July, it was Groves who drafted the final orders to deliver the bombs, quote, as soon as made ready, in, unquote, in early August. Groves likened Truman to a little boy on a toboggan who didn't need to say yes and could have only said no. Groves' biographer, Stan Norris, has noted that Truman had no decision to make and only later chose to exaggerate his role. On August 6th, President Truman said the largest bomb ever used in the history of warfare has been dropped on Hiroshima, an important Japanese army base. He added the Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold. Thus, Truman himself defined Hiroshima as a military event, justifying one surprise attack with another. Score settled. Only later did Truman and his advisors assert that the bombs were necessary to save American and Japanese lives that might have been lost if the Allies had to invade. In time, the bombs' benefits grew and grew to a million casualties spared, then millions of lives saved. This justification was reinforced in a 1947 Harper's Magazine article, The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb by Truman's former Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. The diplomatic historian J. Sam Walker has surveyed scholarship on the Hiroshima decision and refutes as a widely held myth the common belief that Truman had to choose between, on the one hand, authorizing attacks on Japanese cities with atomic bombs, or on the other hand, ordering an invasion. Instead, Walker concluded, and I quote, the historical evidence makes clear that the popular view about the use of the bomb is a mythological construct for the following reasons. There were other options available for ending the war within a reasonably short time without the bomb and without an invasion. Two, Truman and his key advisors believed that Japan was so weak that the war could end before an invasion began. That is, they did not regard an invasion as inevitable. And three, even in the worst case, if an invasion of Japan proved to be necessary, military planners in the summer of 1945 projected the number of American lives lost at far fewer than the hundreds of thousands that Truman and his advisors 
claimed after the war. But just as Truman knew that he hadn't personally decided to drop the first bombs, he soon came to see that his authority as commander-in-chief was not absolutely practice. Truman voiced recurrent fears about losing his authority over the A-bomb, and in 1948 said he did not want to have some dashing lieutenant colonel decide when would be the proper time to drop one. Truman's authority came under challenge again when the Soviet Union exploded its first A-bomb in 1949. After the Korean War began in 1950, he was not a dashing lieutenant colonel, but two flamboyant generals who most troubled Mr. Truman. Air Force General Curtis LeMay claimed he was prepared to dispatch nuclear-armed bombers under his command on his own authority. And when Army General Douglas MacArthur called for using A-bombs in Korea, Truman fired him. Always outspoken, Truman explained this decision by saying, I fired him because he wouldn't respect the authority of the president. I didn't fire him because he was a dumb son of a bitch, although he was, but that's not against the law for generals. If it was, half of three quarters of them would be in jail. And yet many Americans are still eager to believe that killing more than 200,000 people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is somehow a moral event. Yet ironically, more Japanese perished from the Soviet invasion of Manchuria than from the two U.S. A-bombs. A 1955 Gallup poll on the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima <coughs> of Americans who were <coughs> alive at the end of World War II reported that an overwhelming majority agreed with the decision to use atomic weapons against Japan, presumably because of the prevailing belief that the only alternative was an invasion. <clears throat> also in 1995, controversy surrounded the 50th anniversary of the bombings when the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum prepared an exhibit that included the Enola Gay, the B-29 that dropped the first A-bomb on Hiroshima. A public clash was inevitable because of three competing expectations about that anniversary. Some wanted to celebrate the atomic bombings, some wanted to commemorate them, and some wanted to condemn them. There was no common ground. Indeed, while the victors of the Pacific War have found much to celebrate about Hiroshima, the victims have also have a voice about this disputed topic. In fact, for many Japanese, the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki provides a strong sense of what Japanese historian Sadeo Asada calls nuclear victimization. According to Asada, many Japanese have made A-bombs a convenient excuse for, in his words, their general unwillingness to come to grips with their responsibility for the Pacific War and its consequences. Thanks to the bomb, at 8.16 a.m. on August 6, 1945, in a flash, the villains of the Pacific War became its greatest victims. Navy Minister Mitsumasa Yonai said just after Japan agreed to surrender that the use of the atomic bomb and the Soviet entry into the war are gifts from heaven. Why? Not to force surrender on Japan's reluctant military leaders, you and I said, but to avoid a post-war domestic political crisis, and perhaps even a coup by military officers if the war continued much longer. By emphasizing the horrors of Hiroshima, the Japanese may feel less responsibility for the atrocities that their own military committed throughout the Pacific in the 1930s and 1940s. These atrocities included the rape of Ming King in China, the continued, continued with sexual enslavement of comfort women in Korea, and the Bataan Death March in the Philippines. Stressing the lives lost by the bomb prevents the Japanese from confronting what their leaders had done. 
Finally, why were Hiroshima and Nagasaki the first and only targets of atomic bombs? General Groves' target committee had put four Japanese cities off limits to conventional firebombing, so the full effects of an A-bomb might be seen. These were Hiroshima, Kokura, Nagasaki, and Niigata. The committee decided that, quote, the most desirable target would be a vital war plant employing a large number of workers and closely surrounded by workers' houses. To record the effects of an A-bomb, Groves ordered that each target be visible. On August 6th, the Enola Gay flew from Tinian Island to Hiroshima where the sky was clear and visual bombing was possible. The Iranian bomb nicknamed Little Boy destroyed the city. Kokura was to be the second target on August 11th, but Groves advanced the date to the 9th and that day when the B-29 box car reached Kokura, the skies were overcast. Flying back to Tinian Island, the plane detoured to Nagasaki, where clouds parted long enough to see landmarks below. The plutonium bomb, nicknamed Fat Man, destroyed that city. And Groves needed to drop two bombs, a uranium bomb and a plutonium bomb. Why two? To justify the vast expense both the uranium enrichment facilities at Oak Ridge in Tennessee and the plutonium production facilities at Hanford, Washington. Sometimes the military mind employs especially perverse logic. Remember when an American Army commander in Vietnam explained it became necessary to destroy the village in order to save it? His mentor could well have been General Groves, whose similar but reverse strategy was to save four cities in order to destroy them.